Thank you for bearing with us and um, for coming in today to support your children and their classmates. They have worked so hard and they are so excited to share their knowledge with you. Please feel free to clap, cheer for each person after they finish their speech. They certainly deserve it. Um, and just thank you again for being here. And we are going to tell you a little story starting all the way back in the 1700s um, and leading all the way up until present day. We have characters uh, from over 200 years ago up to present day. So we hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Have you ever thought of spying for your country? How about find a war? These are just a few things I did in my life. My name is Nathan Hale. I was born on se in 1755 on June 6 in Connecticut. My mother's name was Elizabeth and my father's name was Richard. I went to Yale University and graduated from Yale in 1773. I got a job as a teacher at Union School. A war was happening. It was the Revolutionary War the British Empire against the Americans. The Americans thought how the British tax was unfair because the taxes were too expensive. The British, no, the American colonies wanted to be a free country. My friend Ben Talmadge, who I had met at Yale, sent me a letter saying that I should join the war effort. It helped me decide to join the war. I had heard all about the American Revolution, including the Boston Tea Party and the battles of Lexington and Concord. I was respected as a teacher and began as a first lieutenant with Connecticut 7th Regiment. My soldiers were very tough and well trained. We went to fight in New York City. One night during the war, me and my soldiers stole a British ship. It was very dangerous. The HMS Asia is the biggest battery ship in the entire British Navy. We had to steal the, sh the supply ship from that ship. In order to win the war, George Washington needed to know what the enemy was doing. Told Thomas Knowlton to ask me to spy on the British and find out their plans. I said yes, that I'd do it. I needed a disguise, so I put on a plain brown suit and pretended to be a teacher. I found a boat that would take me across the East River. When I got there, I made friends with British soldiers and listened to their plans to beat the American army. They said that they would send more soldiers to fight. I wrote down what they said. All I had to do now was walk back to Long Island and share the information I had learned. I stopped to I met a man who appeared to be a friend, but it was the British loyalist Robert Rogers. He recognized me as a colonial soldier and figured out that I was a spy. He told nearby British soldiers about me. They captured me. On September 22nd, 1776, I was executed by the British for spying. I was given the chance to say a final few words. My last words were, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. I am remembered for being America's first spy. the Fulton one, it had 30 cannons on it. My name is Robert Fulton. I was born in Pennsylvania, 1765. I lived on the farm, on a farm, but the land was not good, and we eventually moved. Then my dad died when I was nine. When I was 17, I moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and became apprentice to a silversmith. In 1787, I became an artist with the help of a famous artist, named Benjamin West. I was able to get painting jobs like painting portraits. I saw people using a beautiful stone called marble, and it was hard to carve and cut, so I made a machine that carved this stone. When I was living in Europe, I saw the road was rough. They were building canals to move heavier things. I wrote plans to build a machine that helped boats through canals. Then I wrote this issue to George Washington, and I told him that they should make canals in the U.S. I wanted to get money to build canals in the U.S., so I made a panorama that showed what Paris looked like from the top of the mountain. People paid money to see the panorama. In the 1800s, I built a submarine called the Nautilus. Above water, it looked like a single boat, but it, un, but it could stay underwater for, for several hours. I had to show how it worked. In the U.S., a man named Robert Livingston was trying to build a steamboat so he could bring people from New York to Albany. I built a model boat with a steam engine and turned the wheels on the side. 
Okay. I tested it and it worked. So I left France to build a steamboat in the US. I, it had paddle wheels, score sides, and a steam engine and seals. People doubted me and called it a silly idea, but it worked. It was called the North River. It's, it made its first appearance to, on August 17, 1807. Passengers eventually paid $7 to ride on it. In 1808, I married Harriet Livingston, Robert's niece. We had four kids, one boy named Robert, and three girls named Julia, Cornelia, and Mary. After that, I made a worship named the Fulton when I have 30 cannons on it. I did this because the government thought I could help the war of 1812. I died on February 4th, 1815. I was buried at Trinity Church, which I invented to help pay people, and I had nine patents. So I was an inventor, painter, and known for making the steamboat. goes and seems always to swing open widely for me. I took every opportunity that was given and never shied away. Do you know who I am? I'm Clarissa Harlow Vargan. I was born on December 25th, 1821 in North Oxford, Massachusetts. I had two older brothers and two older sisters. I was four years old when I started school. My two older sisters took care of me and liked teaching me how to read, write, and about geography. My oldest brother, Stephen, taught me math. Uh, my other brother, David, taught me how to ride a horse. I felt like I was out of place in school because I was a bit heavy and was shorter than everyone. I surprised my teacher on my first day of school because I could do tough math and could spell artichoke, and I was only four. My family and I moved to a bigger farm when I was eight, but still in North Oxford. My older brother, David, was badly hurt when he was building a barn and fell off the roof. I was 11 at that time. It took two years for him to heal fully. David grew up to be a soldier. When I turned 13, mothers asked me a lot to babysit their children. Most ch children's families that I babysitted were very poor. I did not make much money because most families were poor, so I babysat for free, and sometimes I asked my father to give them money. I started teaching summer schools in 1839 when I was 17 years old. I taught for 13 years. I was once asked to teach at a winter school because I was an excellent teacher. The winter schools were usually taught only by men. They told me my salary would be lower than the men's salary, and I got angry, so I said, Sometimes I may be willing to teach for nothing, but if my salary is lower than the other men, I should never do men's work. Then they agreed to give me the same salary as the other men. In 1854, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I worked at the painting office. I became a nurse in 1860. In 1861, uh, Civil War began. I traveled for two days from Washington, D.C. to reach Culpeper, Virginia. I asked the governor of Virginia if I could help run the men on the battlefield, but he said, it is too dangerous for a woman to go out there on a battlefield. I said, I got three warehouses full of supply, so they agreed to let me on the battlefield. I helped the rounded men and I collected food, clothes, and other supplies for the soldiers. I created the National Red Cross in 1881 where people get help from war, disasters, or are really hurt and need the care to heal. People thought I was way too old to be the leader and that made me angry, so I retired. I died on April 12, 1912 when I was 90 years old. I lived from 1821 to 1912. The last words were, let me go, let me go. I was a very generous person and helped everyone in need and I hope you'll be inspired by me. Laws are enhanced for the benefit of the whole people and cannot and must not be construed as performing, performing discrimination against some of the people. I am president of all the people of the United States without regard to creed, color, birthplace, occupation, or social condens. I am Theodore Roosevelt and I was born on October 27, 1858 in New York City. As a little boy, I was often sick, so my dad t 
told me to exercise to get well. I came from a wealthy family. My dad was Theodore Roosevelt, sir. My mom was Marta Sports Roosevelt. I had many sisters and brothers. I loved the outdoors. I collected nests, shells, bone, and bones when I visited my summer home. In 1876, I entered Harvard University. Four years later, I graduated in 1880. A couple years later, I married Alice Lee. I was so happy when she gave birth to a girl. Sadly, two days later, Alice died, and so did my mom. I was too sad to stay in New York, so I went out west and left my daughter to my sister. I worked hard out west. I was a rancher, hunter, and cowboy. Two years later, I came back to New York and married Eartha Co. Soon, five more children filled the house. I took charge for the New York police. I became a hero in the Spanish-American War in 1898. I worked for the Navy in Washington, D.C. I built a new ship and we fought in a big battle in Cuba and won. That made me famous. When I returned from Cuba in 1898, I ran for governor of New York and, and won. Two years later, I was elected vice president of the United States and William McKensley was president. In 1901, McKensley was shot and I became president. I was the youngest president at age 42. I finished that term and ran for president in 1904. I won that election. While president, I laughed and played games with my children in the White House. Once they even took a pony upstairs to a bedroom. As president, I helped improve contents and businesses. I love the outdoors and set aside large areas as national parks and forests. I hope help create a might national park where many people go to enjoy nature. I back the building of the Pamana Central and help to build one of the world's largest navies. I was also a pre-marker. Russia and Japan had gone into war in 1904. I helped them show their differences in 1906 and I won the Nobel Peace Prize for my work. William Howard Tanev was president from 1908 until 1912. I supported him at first, but then I did not like some of the things he was doing. I ran for president again in 1912, but lost the election to Woodrow Wilson. When Wood World War I began in 1917. I tried to unleash the army, but I was turned down because I was too old. By 1918, I was not in good health. I was blinded in one eye and had lost some of my hearing. I died on January 6, 1919. I was 60 years old when I died. My face is on Mount Rushmore, and I remember it as one of the greatest presidents. The the greatest shot that ever lived, even though my mom thought it was dangerous. My name is Annie Oakley. My real name is Phoebe Ann Moses. I was born on August 13, 1860. My parents' names were Jacob and Susan Moses, and I had seven brothers and sisters. My father died when I was six. I learned to shoot at age eight, and at age 10, I had to go to a poorhouse. Then I got sold to a farmer. He and his wife beat me when they got angry, so eventually I ran away at age 12. I became very good at shooting, and I put food on the table every day. I met Frank Butler in a shooting contest where we were tied 23 to 23. Frank missed his last shot. With shaky legs, I took a step up, shot, and hit the target. I had walked 23 to 25 against the famous marksman, and I was only 15 at the time. We fell in love and were married in 1876, and in 1884, we joined the Sells Brothers Circus. Then we joined the Wild West Show in 1885. Once during the show, I hit 943 at 1,000 glass balls. In 1887, you performed at Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. I was called clever by Queen Victoria. Now that was a high compliment to me. Frank and I quit the Wild West Show in England in 1888. We eventually rejoined the Wild West Show and headed to Paris. We were a big hit. We were worried that Paris citizens wouldn't like us, but they loved us, even though they didn't understand us. 
The Wild West Show went back to America in 1901. Unfortunately, we got into a train crash that same year. Frank and I stopped performing in the Wild West Show, and we spent the rest of our lives helping poor people. In 1917, we started raising money for troops and performed for free for the soldiers. I died on November 3, 1926, 18 days before Frank in Greenville, Ohio. I'm remembered for an inspiring moment all across the world. I was the first deaf and blind person to get college degree. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson gave me a special award, but that's not what I'm famous for. Hi, my name is Helen Keller. I was born on June 27, 1880 in Genscuba, Alabama. My parents were Kate Keller and Captain Arthur Keller. When I was born, I could see and hear, but then I got really sick when I was only 19 months old. So, what they think might have been meningitis. Soon I got better, but now I'm not able to see or hear. My parents were very worried. My parents met Alexander Graham Bell. He was famous because he had invented a telephone and now he wanted to help deaf children. He told my parents to speak to Ann Sylvan because she once had been nearly, nearly blind herself. In 1887, Anne Sylvan became my teacher and came to live with my family. First, when she taught me, I wasn't really well behaved or enjoying classes. But after a few lessons, it felt better. On April 5, 1887, Anne brought me to a nearby fountain. She put my hand under the water and spelled the word water on my other hand. Again and again, I finally understood. I wanted to know words for everything I touched. Soon, I was able to put words all around the house. And soon, and Anne told, taught me how to read Braille, a special writing for deaf and blind people you read with your fingers by feeling raised dots. I continued to read and learn and even earn a college degree from Radcliffe College. Anne and I became famous because I was the first deaf and blind person to, get called, to earn a college degree. Anne and I went out lecture tours and spoke about my life. I even read a book about my life called the story of my life. That was published in 1902. A special plaque was made for me in 1907, and I even signed it myself. In 1918, I began working for charities and organizations that help people in need. Anne has changed my life a lot. Sadly, she died on October 20th, 1936. After her death, I wrote a book about her called Teacher. I showed the world that deaf and blind people can do great things. I became very ill in 1961 and stopped my tours and lectures. I died in my sleep on June 1, 1968, when I was 87 years old. Today, I am still famous. My biggest accomplishment was help people understand the needs of deaf and blind people. And my, my name is Charles Schultz. My, my dad is named Carl and my mom is named Jenna. When I was a baby, I was nicknamed Sparky. I love comics from the newspaper. They inspired me to be a cartoonist. In 1926, or when I was four years old, our family moved to St. Paul, Minnesota. A few years later, when I was in fourth grade, I started playing hockey after school. During the time I was a senior in high school, I took a correspondence course and learned about cartooning. I started making a comic called Little Folks and wanted it to be in magazines. I graduated from high school when I was 17 years old. I served in World War II and was drafted and sketched a drawing of my military camp. After the war ended, I taught art at the school where I took my correspondence course. Soon I was lettering for a magazine called Timeless Topic. In 1947, I got my big break for the comic Little Folks, and it was published to the St. Paul Pioneer Press. Three years later, it appeared in seven newspapers across the country and changed the name to Peanuts because there was already a comic name similar to Little Folks. Soon after that, I started dating Joyce Halligan. The same last name as my mother, but they are not related. We married in 1951 and moved to California and had five children. Meredith, Monte, Craig, Amy, and Jill. 
I got lots of ideas for the Peanuts characters from family. Like one of my daughters who has a fuss budget, like Lucy, and my kids dragging around blankets like Linus. The name Charlie Brown started out from Charles Brown. Then I changed it to Charlie Brown in honor of my best friend Charlie and my favorite teacher, Mr. Brown. The Peanuts cartoon was very popular. I won Outstanding Cartoonist of the Year in both 1955 and 1964. I brought Peanuts to television in 1965 in the first TV special, A Charlie Brown Christmas. It won Emmy and Peabody Awards. I created many other award-winning specials based on my comics. There was even a musical play created based on the peanut characters of Peanuts called You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. I, am, I even received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. When I was 77 years old, I became sick with cancer and retired, but still continued to make comics for me and my family. I died on February 12, 2000, the night before my last comic strip appeared. Four months after my death, I received the Congressional Gold Medal, the country's highest civilian honor. Today, I t continue to inspire cartoonists around the world, and my characters and stories still bring laughter to everyone who reads them. The end. I got the Kennedy Center Honor in 1996, a few years after I retired, and I was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. My name is Maria Tolchi. I was born on January 24, 1925 in Fairfax, Oklahoma. I was born to the Osage Nation. When I was eight, I moved to Los Angeles, California. My ballet teacher was Branislava Nijinska. She helped me become who I was. When I was 17, I graduated high school and I decided to join ballet groups. People in ballet groups said I should change my name to a Russian name. I said no, I like many. Instead, I changed my last name from Tall Chief, two words, to Tall Chief, one single word. I was known for my technique, grace, and speed. I married George Valentine, a choreographer and leader of Ballet Russe. I starred in many different ballets. I was in Swan Lake, and I was the queen in it. I was in the Nutcracker, and I was a sugar plum fairy. Also, my most famous ballet was the Firebird. In 1947, I left Ballet Russe so I could join my husband's new ballet society, which became the New York City Ballet Society. When I, jo when I joined George's Ballet Society, I learned so much more and that led to me becoming America's first Native American prima ballerina. In 1952, me and Shores decided to divorce, but I still stayed with the New York City Ballet Society. In 1956, I married Henry D. Pastry Jr. Three years later, my beautiful daughter Elise was born in 1959. In 1965, I retired from dancing. Then, in 1974, I began a ballet school in Chicago where I was a director from 1987 through nine, through nine, where I was the director from 1981 through 1987. Then I was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 1996, and I received a Kennedy Center honor that same year. Sadly, I died at age 88 and in the year 2013. Now you remember me as America's first Native American prima ballerina. They thought I was crazy playing tonight because of who I am, but that didn't back me down. Oh. I'm Alcee Gibson. I'm Alcee Gibson. I was born in South Carolina, August 25th, 1927. I was, when I was three years old, my family moved to Harlem in New York City. I don't like school very much. I moved to, I'd rather go to the movies and play ball. As I grew up, my parents, teachers, and policemen meant that I was nothing but trouble. When I was 10 years old, a man named Buddy Walker, who plays jazz down the street, saw a spark in me while playing battle tennis. He was the man who changed my life. He introduced me to real tennis. After I got to practice, Buddy asked a friend to play a few rounds with me. Then, Buddy asked another friend named Juan Sorrell to have me play at the Cosmopolitan. When out there, I didn't fit in, so I said to Buddy, I didn't fit in with these rich society folks. Uh, I'd rather punch them with lights out at the Steelman's gym. I tried many times to leave, but Buddy made me stay. In 1942, I played my first tennis tournament. It was hard, I played well, but I lost in the final round. When I was 15, I quit high school. Two doctors, Herbert Eaton and Robert Johnson, said they would train me to become a great tennis player if I went back to school. I moved to North Carolina to live with the Eatons during the school year and traveled with Dr. Johnson to tennis tournaments during the summer. I eventually won 10 American Tennis Association championships in a row. 
As years went by, I played in many more tennis tournaments. I won some, and I lost some. In 1949, I got invited to play Caucasian player for the first time in a tournament. I lost with a score of 167 to 639, but I still played well. I moved to Florida and went to a and University and continued to play tennis. Now, I'm still not allowed to play in the most important tournaments because of the color of my skin. After graduating, I played more sports. Finally, in 1950, Alice Marvel, a famous tennis player, wrote a letter to a magazine saying that I was one of the best players in the country and that I should have a chance to play in the big tournaments. The letter changed people's minds, and I was finally allowed to play in the U.S. National Championships. I did not win, but I played well. I decided to take a break from tennis. In 1953, I became a physical education teacher at a university in Missouri. I miss playing tennis, so in 1955, I began to play again. In 1957, I finally played at the most important tennis tournament in the world, Wimbledon. I won the whole tournament. Amazingly, in 1958, I was named the Female Athlete of the Year. I've been playing tennis for 20 years. In 1964, I started playing professional golf. In 1971, I became a member of the International Tennis Hall of Fame. I died at age 76 in the year of 2003. I was remembered for not only my tennis skills, but for being the first African-American woman to play in important tennis championships. I led Mitchell Collins and Buzz Aldrin on the famous Apollo 11 mission. I was born on August 5th, 1930. My name is Neil Armstrong. When I was just two years old, I watched planes soar overhead. When I was six, I took my first plane ride. I started building model planes. I found work mowing lawns and working at nearby stores to earn money to buy more model planes as well as books and magazines about airplanes. I took flying lessons at the age of 15. At the age of 16, I got my pilot's license. I joined the Navy at the age of 17. They sent me to college. I had to leave to help fight a war in Korea. I became a fighter pilot. I was very good at it. I won three medals for doing such a great job. I went back to college in 1952. I met Janet Sharon and we got married in 1956. I started working at Edwards Air Force Base in California flying new planes. I helped the Air Force make the X-15 better by changing the steering. In 1962, I joined the Gemini Project, a group that wanted to send men to space. I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. I started working for the National Aeronautics and Space Admission in Houston, Texas. I learned how the Gemini spacecraft worked and how to find a way through space. I left for space on March 16th, 1966 with David Scott aboard the Gemini 8. Our ship started rocking and spinning. When we were about to be stuck in space, I acted quickly and saved the day, bringing the ship back to Earth. I joined the Apollo 11 in 1967 with the goal of flying men to the moon. I learned how to fly a small spacecraft like the one that would land on the moon. I worked with Buzz Aldrin and Mitchell Collins. Each man was given a, given a job. I was the leader on July 16, 1966. We put on our spacesuits and got into the Columbia spacecraft and blasted off. It took three days to reach the moon. 
then buzz, and I got into the eagle to land on the moon. I took the first steps on the moon. It was so soft we could hardly feel it. Pictures were sent back to Earth. On the moon, I said, that's one small step for man, and that's one giant leap for mankind. We ran tests and collected rocks to bring back to Earth. When we got home, there were parades waiting for us. I did not enjoy the intention and wanted a quieter life. I worked for the space, in the space program a few more years, and I moved back to Ohio in 1971. I died in Cincinnati, Ohio during heart surgery on August 25th, 2012. I'm remembered for being the first man on the moon. I could see tiny jelly, small shrimp, the glint of silver from a curious fish, and the translucent from a speckled octopus. I'm a marine biologist. My name is Sylvia Alistair. I was born on August 30th, 1935. I grew up in New Jersey on a farm. Me and my family moved to Florida by the Gulf of Mexico. I have a mom, dad, and two brothers. My mother, Alice, encouraged me to get dirty and explore. After I explored the ocean and experienced marine life, I then decided to be a scientist. I did not go too deep in the ocean yet. I graduated from high school in 1952 at age 16. I went to St. Petersburg Junior College in St. Petersburg, Florida. I earned a degree in art and also learned how to scuba dive. Then I enrolled at Florida State University and studied botany. In 1956, I earned a higher degree in botany from Duke University in North Carolina. I studied algae in the Gulf of Mexico. I got married in 1957 to John Taylor and we had two children, 1967 and to Boston. In 1967, I moved to Boston, Massachusetts and worked at Harvard University. My research focused on brown algae in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. I, have, um, I applied to the first tech project in 1969, but I was declined and they did not want men and women living together. In 1970, I led an all-female crew on a two-week mission. We studied the plants and fish in the area. The mission was called Tech Type 2. In 1975, I made history while on an expedition on the submarine Johnson Sea Lake. I saw a gathering of plants. It was a type of seaweed no one had ever documented before. I officially named that plant. I named it Johnson Sea Linka Profunda. It means deep. That plant was found deep in the ocean. I found a new way to dive deeper. I used a special diving suit named Jim. It was created in 1971. Wearing it allows you to dive 1,900 feet. It weighs up to 1,000 pounds on land. I spent weeks practicing using gym. I learned how to get in and out of the suit, including its massive helmet. On September 19, 1979, near Oahu, Hawaii, I rode deeper into the ocean. I was strapped to the front of Star 2, a small submarine. When I landed on the floor, I hit the surface at 1,250 feet. I walked on the ocean floor alone. I set a world record for the deepest untethered dive. June 1984, I piloted the deep rover 3,000 feet down to the Pacific waters near San Diego, California. I worked with my third husband to create an underwater craft. 1990, U.S. President George H.W. Bush appointed me to a new job. I became chief of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. I was the first woman to hold this position. In 1992, I made my deepest personal dive aboard a Japanese submersible called the Shinken. I reached a depth of 13,065 feet. It was 2.5 miles, 4 kilometers. In 1995, I published a book called Sea Change. A Message of the Oceans was a powerful argument of protecting the seas. The book was compared favorably to the scientist Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. It has been credited with the starting in the environmental movement. I won over 100 awards and honors. In 2009, Mother's Library of Congress called me a living legend. Then, in 2009, I was awarded the TED Prize. I used that $1 million that came with it to fund Mission Blue. As long as I am breathing, I am diving. I am still researching, diving, exploring, and teaching others about the ocean today.
Many people thought I was crazy for trying to get famous by creating a Muppet show, although I thought get famous. My name is Jim Henson. I was born on September 24, 1936. I had a brother and two parents, a mom and a dad. As a child, I spent time with my grandmother, drawing, painting, and so on. She encouraged my interest in art and taught me how important it was to use my imagination. In fifth grade, my family moved to Maryland. In high school, I created sets for school plays and drew cartoons for our yearbook. I started working with a local television station while I was still in high school. I worked with puppets on a Saturday morning program. A year later, in 1955, I was given my own show called Sam and Friends. It was a five-minute show that aired daily and had puppets such as Kermit the Frog and others. Hi, I'm Kermit the Frog. <laughs> I went to college at the University of Maryland and studied home economics, learning more about sewing and stage design. I also met Jane Neville, and we were married in 1955. I graduated from Maryland in 1960. I made my puppets out of soft felt so they could show more emotion. I gave them sticks instead of string to control their arms. Their movements, I came up with the word Muppet, a combination of marionette and puppet. In the early 60s, the Muppets started appearing on TV shows across the country. So my family moved to New York so we could be on TV every week. In 1966, I was asked to help create a show for public television. I would teach children through TV. The show was Sesame Street. It started in 1969, and children around the country met some of my characters for the first time, such as Big Bird, Oscar the Grouch, Bert and Ernie, and more. These characters taught viewers math and value using fun and humor. Today, 20 countries have their own version. In 1976, the Muppet movie was introduced, and it had Kermit the Frog from Sam and Friends, as well as Miss Piggy and Gonzo. Children and adults both loved the show, and many celebrities were guests on the show. In 1979, the Muppet movie was released, and it was a hit. In 1982, we created The Dark Crystal, and it was about animation and dark fantasy. It used animatronics and new ways of puppeteering. My next film was The Labyrinth. It combined live action, puppets, and music. I helped the industry grow. In 1979, Jim's Creature Shop began in London. It helped make characters for movies with the goal of always putting art and imagination first. In 1982, the Jim Henson Foundation was created to promote the art of puppetry. Unfortunately, in 1990, I became ill and died at the age of 53 years old. In 2005, the U.S. Postal Service made a stamp in honor of me and the puppets I created. In 2011, I was honored with the Disney Legends Award. People still remember me for my puppeteering and the wonderful characters and shows I created. My hope is still to leave the world a little bit better than when I got here. Have you ever designed a memorial or win a prize for making a memorial to fit 58,000 names at age 21? Well, I have. My name is Maya Lynn and I was born October 5th, 1959. When I was little, I liked to read and play in the woods instead of watch TV. I had really good grades in school and went to Yale University. I studied architecture and sculpting. I believe in 1981, there was a Vietnam Veterans Memorial Contest. I believed we should honor veterans, and I decided to enter. When I, I got started right away. When I got to the location, I imagined a knife cutting into the ground and spread from one end to the other. I knew lots of people would go for something white, so I went with Black Grant. It would have each and every soldier's name engraved on it. Lots of people wrote badly about my design and about making the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Some people thought the Vietnam Veterans Memorial 
thought it would be a place of sadness and people would never want to come. In 1981, an announcer said, and the winner is Maya Lin. Everybody, even I, were so surprised. I was only 21 and still in school. The U.S. Senate had a hearing up about my design and decided to let it be built. In on 1982, on Veterans Day, the memorial is finished. I found the name of my father's friend of the memorial and started to cry. So many people came that day. 58,000 names brought lots of visitors. In 1986, I got his master's degree in architecture and moved to New York to work privately. I was asked to design the Civil Rights Movement Memorial I took the offer and got started to get to work right away. In 1989, the Civil Rights Movement Memorial is finished. It is a low table engraved with all the civil rights workers who died. It is in Montgomery, Alabama. I was also asked to design the outdoor sculpture in Joanna College in Huntington, Pennsylvania. I decided to make a simple circle. The circle was 40 feet wide, and when people sell the stones, everybody is equal. No one is the head of the table. It is called the Peace Chapel. In 1990, I made an outdoor masterpiece. Big holly bushes shaped as balls. I wanted to do something fun. You can find that piece of art in Charlotte, New York. Later in 1990, I made a sea green table that has water running off the table. I made this masterpiece in Connecticut Yale University. It is supposed to honor the women of Yale. In 1993, I used 43 tons of recycled glass to make hill-like designs. I call it Groundsville. This is at the West Museum here in Columbus, Ohio. In 1995, I made Wayfield at the University of Michigan in Ann Harbor. I won an architecture award in 1996. Have you ever heard of Langston Hung's Library in Tennessee? I created that in 1999. I also wrote a book called Boundaries in 2000. It tells about how I think of myself as an artist. It is in, it, it, in downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I made a clip dip to honor Rosa Parks. In the winter, they fill clip dip up with water and then ta-da, an ice rink. In the summer, they use it as restaurant seating. I'm still alive today, and so are my pieces of art. I'm just another architect, but no for design the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Thank you. Well, you can't really see the students very well, but if you can just kind of turn around a little bit, let's give them one big round of applause for a masterful performance. Thank you so much. This is the, the first performance we've been able to do where we've had parents involved, and it is just it was wonderful to see you coming into the building this afternoon, and I know you kid coming in, it was just as exciting for you. And I wanted you to just think back to a year ago, because second grade, if you remember the State Fair Project, this was almost exactly a year ago to the day, and it was the last, all the second grade parents were in here, and the only modification we made, normally you would go and you would get to go around to all the different homerooms in grade two and look at all the different projects. And we thought, that's a lot of parents moving around, so just stay in your child's homeroom class. And that was the, the last uh, parent performance uh, that we had where the students could perform in front of their parents. So it is great to have you back. Great job, third grade. And what a wonderful job getting it all ready and, and performing it today. And this was... All, all uh, the third grade teachers, they, they asked me to come to a meeting a couple months ago and said, Mark, you know, we really, we really want to do something where we can have the parents come in. The kids work so hard on this project, and we really want to do something where they can come in and watch. And so working with uh, Eric Hunker and Nurse Hoagland and Nurse Fireman, that are, all three of them are here, the, everything we presented to them and that the third grade team, they're like, 
yes, we can do this. We can make sure we do all the modifications. So we'd like to thank our COVID-19 response team. Thank you so much. And of course, for this group, Mrs. Sinclair, who, who did a, a wonderful job preparing. I don't, she's, it's her heart and heart up there. But Mrs. Sinclair, you saw how, how well prepared the students were. And not only that, how excited and, and joyful they were in presenting. So uh, thank you very much to all the adults, but especially to the students in, in Mrs. Sinclair's class. And it's been